what? I have an exercise to get you started with. And uh, there are people, so as people trickle in, I want to go ahead and give you this exercise. You can start working on it so we can get started earlier. The exercise to start out with today is to write a short paragraph, a short narrative paragraph. So like storytelling of, you know, just very short, like 100 to 150 words, um, you know, using with each sentence using seven or fewer words. And then uh, when you're done with that, write a, a longer paragraph that is one single sentence about the same thing, okay? So we're gonna, one short paragraph with short sentences of seven words or less, and one long paragraph that's just one long sentence. So just free write it. Don't worry, I won't make you read it unless you, you know, want to, but I, and I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but I wanna sort of get the feel for, because one of the things we're gonna be talking about today is shorter versus longer, okay? So go ahead and start that and I'll, as people trickle in, I will give people the same assignment. Okay, so again, don't worry if you haven't uh, finished it up. Uh, really, it's more of a sense of just getting a feel for it. And um, let's go ahead and jump in and I will continue to check just in case there are other people that are trickling in. Um, but uh, okay, so we'll come back to this exercise, I promise. Um, but I wanna talk, a, a, a just sort of start a, a little bit in terms of what we're gonna be talking about today and stuff like that. So in, um, in last week, in lesson one, we talked about the core qualities of great sentences, which are economy, specificity, and musicality. And I'm not gonna go, go through and sort of review all those topics now, um, though I will be referring back to them frequently uh, today. So, if you, if, if you missed the first lesson or if you want to review it or if you're listening to a recording of this sometime in the future and you haven't listened to the first one, I, I highly recommend that you go back and review that recording, which um, the skills will send you a link to automatically if you signed up for the package. This lesson also will be recorded and everyone will be receiving a link to it um, sometime during the week. Did you guys all, all get the link to the one from last week? Okay, good. No. All right, so any, um, any thoughts or questions before we dive back into this topic of sentences? Ooh, somebody wants to come in. Well, if it doesn't seem like the third time rehashing, um, I I've been thinking about the um, um, semicolon and yeah. I, I get confused between and and maybe I'm using them in totally the wrong way, but semicolons and the use of like m dashes. Mm, yeah, is that? Am I even presenting this as though I even understand the difference? <laughs> no, I mean like... I think you can. They can in some ways. I I mean I do find myself sometimes using them interchangeably, but I think you know. So what I was kind of trying to stress last week is that a lot of it. It's not necessarily the rules, it's the way that it sort of sounds musically. Right. M dash to me um, is more like either, it's either an afterthought or it's sort of like a very specific kind of pause. To me, it's sort of like an active pause, like here it comes. You know, we'll see if we run into any of them today and we'll sort of point okay. them out. Um, but yeah, I think that they can, in, in many, many ways they can be used interchangeably. Maybe a semicolon would be considered more formal than an M dash. Does anybody have any other thoughts on that? M dashes versus semicolons? I love both of them, by the way. I use both of them all the time. Nope. Okay, so uh, Victoria, welcome. Um, we just, had, what I had everyone do when, we, when they first came in was to write two paragraphs, one that was short uh, with using uh, short sentences of seven words or fewer, and then one that was long, just one long sentence. Um, and about the same general thing. And so what, what I want to do now is to have, is to, and, and, and um, you haven't done it, but you can just sort of join the discussion anyway, is, is what did you notice about the two different styles of writing sentences? What, 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 what was the short, how, how did, what did you see the difference between the shorter one that you wrote, you know, the shorter sentences and the longer ones? Anyone? Oh, uh, yeah, Lee. I actually found this the, writing the shorter sentence is very difficult. Hmm. We didn't get to the second paragraph, but yeah. I was thinking, how can I make this? How can I chop this up so it doesn't sound terrible? But yeah. I was, kept wanting to go. Yeah, so it, it, it wasn't didn't feel natural to you. No short sentences. Yeah. Did anyone have a, sort of the opposite reaction that you know writing? Yeah, David, you had. Sort of yeah. yeah, well, because my my character is first person 
young elephant. And of course, I, I know how to talk and elephant yep. speak, uh, young elephant speak. So he, he's okay writing clipped sentences all, uh, all the time and expressing himself. And then I had real difficulty trying to do it as run on. So it's just the way I write him. I just figured I'd try the challenge, same perspective. And yeah. so it's interesting. That's good. That's a really interesting thing that it's telling you about the voice of your character. Your character right. like to speak in short uh, clipped sentences, which kind of makes sense for an elephant, I guess, especially a young yeah. elephant. <laughs> especially. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Well, what about in terms of the, the sort of qualitative difference? Well, what did you sort of notice or what do you what would you say in general about the difference that's uh, between short sentences and longer sentences in terms of what they how they can be used? Um, I, I um, found that writing the longer sentences um, allowed me to be more reflective mm. um, and I don't know how to express this, but it, it, I just got into the material in a way that, uh, that felt more like exploring a topic rather than just summarizing a topic yeah that's really interesting yeah I, I i can i that's a very interesting thing and we'll i think we'll, we'll we'll talk about that as we go and why that might be victoria um i didn't do the exercise unfortunately i'm sorry i was late but um i do feel like short sentences tend to increase they can depending on the situation increase the urgency mm -hmm. um at, whereas i do think that long you know flowing sentences can tend to be i agree with more reflective yeah. Um, but often when you have those short sentences, it's like something intense is happening and you're, um, and you, you tend to read because you read them more quickly, I think. Yeah. Um, it gives that feeling. Is that, yeah. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but. Well, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I don't think there's any really, there's any such thing as accuracy in this case. It's no right, no, there's no right answer. Um, yeah. But I think that we can sort of get a, an intuitive feel for the, some of the differences that can that can come from writing in short sentences versus longer sentences. So short sentences tend to be more declarative. They tend to be, you know, uh, to use Marianne's word, not as reflective or maybe unreflective. They are often are stating information without necessarily processing it. Uh, more difficult to describe complex emotions. You know, Lee said that it was difficult for her to write, and that may be part of the reason that it's very hard to get complex emotions in the short sentence sentences. You know, short sentences have this uh, feeling of being more hard boiled. You know, um, you know, and and I think what Victoria was getting at is, is short sentences are also often used for action. They're often used for a sense of suppressed emotion. Hemingway uh, was sort of famous for using a lot of short sentences and it was also famous for using a lot of subtext, what isn't said, you know, whereas long sentences, you know, they, it's, it's, it's more taking the reader somewhere, exploring, I think Marianne said, you know, going on a tour maybe where the entire effect is more important than one key piece of information and maybe can go deeper, able to express more color, more warmth, more lushness in terms of descriptive detail, more complexity of emotion and character, um, they can be like a postcard of a single moment, not really as good necessarily as short sentences in terms of portraying a chain of actions, um, but they, they can give you a sense of, of kind of uh, overflowing emotion, you know, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this all as we go, but I, I just want to sort of get, you know, this is a very sort of first blush look at it. I think we'll get a much more better idea as we go on today. And we're particularly today going to be talking about long sentences. Um, and um, and so so we'll come back to this in terms of short versus long uh, later. But I've, I, you know, for the first thing I want to dive in today is this idea of creating, well, before we do that, before we do this, this first thing, are there any final thoughts on short versus long before we continue? We'll, again, we are going to come back, especially to, we'll, be, we'll come back today and we'll come back again next week when we talk about um, varying the lengths of sentences. So, so one of the things I've noticed in, in reading recently is that like particular write, diff writers may choose to do it this way, I, I think have been paying more attention to like John Le Carre um, book I've been reading, it, the narrative. Uh, is all really short clipped for the most part, you know, and there's usually some intensity going on. And, 
in the in that scene, but when he gets into descript describing the scene, then he, he chooses a lot much longer uh, sentence and uh, oh. and he does some beautiful writing, which is in contrast to these, in a sense, they're gangsters that he's, that are that are talking. You know, they're they're spies, but they're. We, which which uh, which one are you reading? Um, I just finished um, the one about um, the tailor of Panama. It's, oh, it's not yes. as it's not as popular, but and it and it ends. They're all dark, right? Oh, yeah, they all right. end in the dark, but it, yeah. but it, I found it quite compelling when I first started it. Towards the end, so, I got a little bit bummed out of, about where it was headed, but yeah, yeah. no, that's a really uh, that's a really good observation. Um, and Le Carre, I think, is a great is a great one to study. He really is kind of a genius. Um, was just passed away recently, but yes, you know, I think that 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 could be an accurate thing. You would probably find a much greater, greater concentration of longer sentences in the descriptive passages than you would in the in the sort of action scenes. So great. Okay. Well, um, so I want to talk about suspense. You know, since we were talking about John Le Carre, I want to talk about suspense, but suspense at the at the sentence level. And I want to talk first um, about periodic uh, or suspensive sentences, which involve sort of planting a sort of internal question at the beginning of a sentence and not answering it till the end. Um, these, so these sentences uh, have often have little asides or delaying phrases in the middle, and these free phrases uh, reserve the most important meaning of the sentence until the end. Um, let's take a look. Let's let's actually read these first three examples. Can I get someone to read? Let's just have, can someone read these first three examples and give us the name of the author as well? Yeah, Lisa, thank you. Um, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. James Baldwin, the fire next time. Um, after five years of marriage and a child, George and I finally resolved that we were ready for the more profound intimacy of library consultations. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Fadiman, ex Libris. Huh. <laughs> the date was April 14th, 1912, a sinister day in maritime history. But of course, the man in suite 63-65, shelter deck C, did not yet know it. Okay. Eric Larson, the devil in the white city. Excellent, thank you. So do you see how, how the way, this way of structuring the sentence can be suspenseful or propulsive in the sense that you, they keep the reader sort of moving or guessing until the end of the sentence? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Those are called periodic or suspensive sentences. And, um, you know, of course, they can also propel you into the next sentence. And, and I think that with, the Kate, with that Larson sentence in particular, we're like, okay, whoa, <laughs> what is the next sentence going to tell us, right? We did, did, you know, it turns out that this is, this is what, uh, you know, the Titanic, right? So it's sort of like, a, it's just a great example of the use of dramatic irony. Like we know something that the character doesn't know. So there's a lot of tension and suspense in this sentence that isn't just the way the sentence is constructed, but the way the sentence is constructed is giving us suspense too. So we see that? Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, let's look at a few more and, and let's pay attention to how suspense can be established and sustained throughout even longer sentences. Will someone um, read us the next three? Anyone? Yeah, Victoria, great. <laughs> I was born in 1927, the only child of middle-class parents, both English, and themselves born in the grotesquely elongated shadow, which they never rose sufficiently above history to leave, of the monstrous, that monstrous dwarf Queen Victoria, John Fowles, the Magus. High school was Don Bosco Tech, and since Don Bosco Tech was an urban all-boys Catholic school packed to the strakes with a couple hundred insecure, hyperactive adolescents, it was, for a fat sci-fi reading nerd like Oscar, a source of endless anguish. Juno Diaz, <laughs> The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Will. I can say to myself that a good part of my private and social character, the kinds of scenery and weather and people and humor I respond to, the prejudices I wear like dishonorable scars, the affections that sometimes waken me from middle-aged sleep with a rush of undiminished love, the virtues I respect and the weakness I condemn, the code I try to live by, 
the special ways I fail at it and the kinds of shame I feel when I do, the models and heroes I follow, the colors and shapes that evoke my deepest pleasure, the way I adjudicate between personal desire and personal responsibility have been in good part scored into me by that little womb village and the lovely, lonely, exposed prairie of the homestead. Okay, great, Wallace thank you. Stegner. Wallace Stegger, right, thanks. And Marking the Sparrow's Fall, which is a collection of, uh, actually a mix of stories and essays. That's, that's really good. So the question is, do, do you see how each of these sentences sort of poses a question that it doesn't answer until the end of the sentence? It's, it's basically a delaying tactic. Um, but it's a wonderfully effective one, and it can really help make your prose more propulsive in general uh, to you, you know, quite apart from narrative drive, which is a whole different topic. But um, it, it, it's a sort of propulsion at the sentence level. And of course, as with anything else, you don't want to overuse them, but this is a, this is a, a tool for your toolbox, just to create suspense at the sentence level by delaying the answer to the question that you pose near the beginning of the sentence. And obviously it doesn't have to be at the very beginning and answering it at the very end, um, but uh, it is sort of you know, using that pattern of kind of posing a question near the beginning of the sentence and answering the question near the end of the sentence. Does that make sense? It's a very, very useful tool. Okay. Um, and, and I, I want to also refer back to the conversation we had in lesson one, because it's not only about suspense, it's also about rhythm. Remember how we talked a lot about, we started talking about sentence level musicality and, and specifically about how rhythm can contribute to musicality. So the question is, do you see how um, saving or delaying the most important meaning sentence until, until the end kind of packs a greater rhythmic punch? Um, while at the same time throwing the central meaning of the sentence into high relief. Do you see that? I mean, you can look at it with a, the Stegner sentence. This is a, a sentence about the homestead, and that is sort of the most important, important part, and it sort of throws that in high relief to have that at the end. Or you can look at that John Fowle sentence where we have, you know, this sort of, you know, this, this standard sentence, and all of a sudden at the very end we have of that monstrous dwarf Queen Victoria, it really packs a punch, right? Um, and, and that is something that is important in terms of rhythm, saving the, 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 big, the big meaning or sort of the big impact for the end of the sentence. Um, and, and just sort of the, you know, sticking with this idea of, of rhythm for a moment, because remember how we said um, that, you know, that, and this is something that for actually for today and, and the next one, we're going to be going uh, continually coming back to the idea of musicality in sentences. But um, this idea of the final word or phrase in a sentence is a way to end with stress, emphasis, and kind of power that resonates in the, in the white space after the period. So that's why we have not the infamy of this day will live on but a day that will live in infamy. So, um, you know, it's infamy. And that, that's the, that, that is sort of a phrase that, you know, uh, FDR said, you know, at, right after Pearl Harbor that kind of rings out through history in part because of the way that sentence is constructed. That infamy rings out um, in, in the white space um, and the pause. Uh, and so, you know, and, and the same thing, applies in workaday sentences too. You know, we, we looked at this example from Strunk and White uh, last week. This, this steel is primarily used for making razors because of its hardness versus because of its hardness, this steel is primarily used for making razors. You see the difference there? It is subtle, but it's this idea of saving the most important thing, the most, maybe in this case, the most concrete thing the thing that the sentence is really about, saving it to the end to sort of pack more of a rhythmic punch. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay. So, so I, I think this is a really important concept for improving your sentence level writing. I use it um, when I am, uh, you know, when I'm doing like a late revision or something. I don't worry about any of this you know, the sentence level stuff very much at all when I'm doing first drafts or, or second drafts or even, you know, third or whatever middle drafts. But when I get to the last draft, then I really start reading the prose slowly to myself and, 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 and using techniques like this to really try to work on the musicality. Um, so uh, let's do a quick exercise here. 
and just uh, do, um, let's just take, you know, three or four minutes to either write a suspensive sentence or quickly look through the pages of your own work and try to find one of your sentences that is not suspensive, but could be. So we're basically delaying the subject, saving the greatest impact of the end. Okay, let's take like three or four minutes. I'll just, I'll call you back in, in about four minutes. Again, you're just writing a suspensive sentence, delaying the impact. Okay, how did that go? If you're still working on it, keep going. But how did it go? Does anybody want to share what they're, what they're it looks like actually some, some people are still working, so continue to do that if you want. But would anyone like to read what they wrote aloud? Understanding that it's first draft and there's no judgment? <laughs> Lisa, I heard you laughing. No, you don't have to. You're still muted though. I think you were unmuted and then you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. There you go. A vast, white, cushy expanse. All decorative pillows jettisoned for, quote, sanitary reasons, end quote. A bed for all seasons, all hours. A bed you can both live in and die in. Introducing the iBed. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love that. Because we're waiting, you know, the, the way that, 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 that that's set up is we're sort of waiting because it's not, you know, it's sort of like, you know, these phrases that aren't missed, there's no sort of, it's not like, doesn't begin like a typical sentence. So we're waiting for it to finish. And then it turns out to be the iBed. I love it. That's nice. It's very sci-fi. Anyone else want to want to share uh, a sentence that they wrote? Not necessary, but if anyone wants to, okay, okay. Well, let's move on then. Um, so, so now I want to talk about the 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 kind of meat or the, the core of today's of today's you know lesson, which has to do with building longer sentences. So I want to talk begin by talking about uh, the basic parts of a sentence, but I don't mean this in in the sense of um, 
subject, verb, object, participles, etc. Now I'm not going to sort of resort to the to the familiar jargon of grammar, because to some degree, as writers, I really want to encourage us to get away from the rules to see because I think that you know at this point we all pretty much have a very good intuitive grasp grasp of grammar, and if we don't, then editors will will do their best to correct us, but. To see grammar as more fungible, to find, way, new, find ways to play with the language. So the, the, the basic unit of meaning I want to talk today is something that, called the proposition. The proposition is a singular statement about meaning. So, for example, and I think this is on your, um, on your, your handout, the sentence, the cat went to the moon and back, could be broken into two propositions. The cat went to the moon, the cat came back. In fact, there are, so there, 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 there are two singular statements of meaning there. The cat went to the moon, the cat came back. So this sentence contains two propositions, okay? So um, let's, let's talk about a few additional units of me meaning. We've been talking about them, uh, but makes, you know, let's, let's sort of define that. And that is the clause versus the phrase. Very simple you know, way to look at this is that the clause could stand alone as a sentence, a, a clause can stand alone as a sentence, but a phrase can't. Okay, so that the, but there 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 are parts of the sentence. So, the cat came back would be a clause, and and back would be a phrase. Okay. So that's th th those are the th that's what we're going to be working with. That's all. That's the extent of the sentence level jargon we're going to be talking about. We will be talking about some other jargon when it comes to cumulative syntax. But anyway. So what I want to notice is that if we have um, a number of propositions in a sentence, we, we have the option of breaking them down and reducing them from clauses to phrases. And the advantage of doing this is that it allows us to make longer sentences that are easier to read, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, it seems at first, that a long sentence can be easier to read, right? But the cat went to the moon and back is an example of a sentence that does exactly this. Do you see how it, that sentence contains two propositions? It contains two potential uh, clauses, but we basically, instead of saying um, the cat went to the moon, the cat came back, we just say, we break it, we sort of shrink it, and we say the cat went to the moon and back. So the cat, you know, the, it, the cat came back is a clause that we're reducing to a phrase to make a longer sentence. And that longer sentence, ironically, maybe, it flows better. It's quicker than reading the two sentences, right? And so, um, you know, that, that's an important point because I think that we often hear, like, you know, in, in English classes and writing workshops that, um, you know, short sentences are better, that long sentences confu confuse the reader. Um, but I think it's important that, you know, writing short sentences is not crucial to conveying meaning in, a, in the most clear and efficient way, that shortening the elements of the sentence is important. Um, it's one of the, you know, one of the keys to creating one of the things we talked about yesterday, economy, sentence level economy, because it allows us to convey meaning in a clear and efficient way. The cat went to the moon and back, moves things along more efficiently, more quickly than the cat went to the moon, the cat came back. So we have a longer sentence that is also more economical than two shorter figure sentences. Go figure. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay. So, um, so, so the question is, I mean, you know, this, let's come back to this thing that I just said that often we often hear that you know, longer sentences are hard to understand. And, you know, one of the first things you probably were told, or many of us were told in, in English composition is, you know, you need to break down your sentences. The reader is not going to be able to follow you because you're going with these really long sentences, you know, break them down into smaller pieces. And that, you know, there, there is a lot of sense to that. But, um, you know, the question of whether longer sentences just by nature are more difficult to understand, I think is really questionable. And um, so let's, um, let's, let's, as an example, our first example of a really long sentence, um, let's, will someone read us this sentence from Ray Bradbury's The Sound of Thunder? Yeah, David. Yeah, out of, out of chars and ashes, out of dust and coals, like golden salamanders, the old years, the green years, 
might leap, roses sweet in the air, white hair turns Irish black, wrinkles vanish, all enter, all, everything fly back to seed, flee dust, rush down to their beginnings, suns rise in the western skies and set glorious east, moons eat themselves opposite to the custom, all and everything, cup, cupping one another like Chinese boxes, rabbits into hats, all and everything returning to the fresh death and the seed death, the green death, to the time before the beginning. A touch of a hand might do it. Merest touch of a hand. Ray Bradbury, The Sound of Thunder. Great, thank you. So this is this is a, one of, I think, one of the greatest passages ever written about time travel. This is a story about time travel. And this is a sentence, this is a, two sentences actually, describing traveling backwards in time. And um, I don't think it's particularly hard to understand. I don't know if you do, um, but I also think that it's just really striking in terms of the rhythm of it, uh, the sort of prophetic tone of it. It's like the, the, the like waves crashing on a shore, which we talked about last time. There's something mesmerizing about it, the sense of movement through vast swaths of time and space. We'll come back to this sentence, um, but you know, could you create anything like this effect if you were to break this entire thing down into a series of short sentences? It's a rhetorical question. I mean, I, I don't think so. I think that, that one of the reasons that, that the sentence, the two sentences actually are so striking is because of the length, the fact that it, the way that it reads, it's, it is like sort of waves crashing on a side. It gives us, it gives us this, this sense of movement through time. Um, and it's, it's just rhythmically really striking. So um, don't let anyone tell you that long sentences should be avoided because they're too hard to read. They're too hard to read if they're not well constructed. This sentence, the first sentence that we just re read is really well constructed and we'll, we'll come back to break that down later. But, um, and sometimes long sentences are absolutely the most appropriate way to get across the mood um, and the meaning that we're going for uh, while at the same time moving things along in terms of pacing. Uh, imagine, you know, let's, let's imagine this, this, this Ray Bradbury passage broken up into a bunch of short sentences. Do you see how it might become slower and more plodding? So sort of like the cat went to the moon, the cat came back, the cat did this, the cat did that, because you're repeating a lot of information instead of just kind of flowing it all together. So um, any thoughts on that? Does that make sense? So, you know, um, long sentences are a way to make your prose richer. And this may be a little counter counterintuitive by adding more specificity. Remember, you know, that specificity was the second. So economy was the first, specificity was the second of the, the qualities of great sentences that we discussed last time. And remember this Tolstoy sentence that we discussed the other day in George Saunders, you know, in a swim in a pond in the rain, wrote the sentence that he would have written. He said, the maid carried the samovar to the table, table and Tolstoy instead wrote, after flicking with her apron, the top of the samovar, which was now boiling over, she carried it with an effort to the table, raised it, and set it down with a thud. So do you see how the longer sentence allows us to achieve that greater specificity that makes the sentence come alive for us and makes the scene that Tolstoy is painting here more immersive because it's harnessing that human um, tendency to let our imaginations go free and for our imaginations to begin constructing, you know, when we're confronted with this, you know, vivid specific concrete detail, like the way that the maid is flicking her apron, the way that the samovar is boiling over, the sound of it, you know, hitting the table with a thud, th that activates our Im imagination and the black marks on the white page go from black marks on the white page to being the, the you know, vivid continuous dream of narrative, right? And this is only positive, possible because Tolstoy wrote a much longer sentence than Saunders would have written. Um, so sometimes I think we can, we can agree, maybe, maybe argument with you or not, but I think we can agree that longer sentences are sometimes called for, right? But how do we make those sentences clear and economical? Because remember, we don't want to give up on economy. I mean, we established that economy doesn't necessarily mean shortness, doesn't mean, mean briefness, 
but how can we make long sentences that are economical and clear? So there, there are three um, methods, simple methods that I wanna sort of begin with as a way of kind of warming up to this discussion, discussion of cumulative syntax. Um, and this is a, a, you know, building longer sentences in ways that contribute to the specificity of the sentences, sort of enriching and enhancing the meaning and content of the sentences. And if you're a writing, writing fiction or memoir, the immersiveness, right, by using this detail without sacrificing clarity or economy. And these three methods are connective, adjectival, and subordinate, okay? So I'll just, I'll just walk you through this. So we, we start with a kernel sentence or a base clause. You know, this is a proposition, right? That we, and, and to use the term we talked about earlier. So the Senate, the core sentence is he went to the store. This is the core sentence that we're gonna be working on as we go through these three methods, okay? So the first way to make this longer is connective. And connective is just adding, you know, using words like and, because, and in to simply join one clause or phrase to the next. So he went to the store in town, the longer sentence, and it gives us more specificity, right? Or he went to the store and then to the library because he wanted to kill time, okay? So now that we're getting more specific, we're getting longer sentences by connecting, simply connecting phrases and clauses. Is that clear? So, okay, so then the next, the next method that we might use is called subordinative. And this is where we use words like who, which, or that to clarify something about the preceding clause. So again, we're still working with this uh, base proposition, he went to the store. Okay, so here's a subordinative version of that. He went to the store that his father owned. Or he went to the store that his father, who was an evangelical Christian, owned. Okay, so that's subordinative. We're getting more. We're getting more specificity by making these longer sentences using subordinative um, connection. Okay, and then the third one is adjectival, and this is modifying words or phrases, adding to or refining the meaning of the of the first clause. Okay, so he went to the candy store, feeling down on his luck, hoping to purchase a remedy, or. He went to the store, a squat, weather-beaten building with a dusty picture window and a bulletin board crowded with tacked up wanted posters, okay? So we see, we see how those, those sentences all take that very short, basic sentence, which is the sentence that a lot of us might use in the first draft of something. He went to the store and make it richer in each of these three ways by adding, by making it longer, by adding clauses and phrases. Does that make sense? So there's no reason to get caught up in these categories. And this is, this is just a way of breaking down what happens when we're, when we're, we're writing. Um, I, I mentioned last time, my friend who Victoria knows called Edgar Kunz, a poet who, who, who talked about um, letting the rose bush grow wild. I think he was quoting another poet, but he said, basically don't trim don't trim the rose bush. You know, the rose bush, you have to let the rose bush go grow wild before you trim it back. And, you know, this is a great, I think this is really one of the great things that we can use in writers for revision. Don't start going, jumping to making things economical too early. Let the rose bush grow wild because there's a lot of richness in there. Then once you've got the, the wildness of the rose bush, all of this, this different meaning and specificity, then you can start trimming back the rose bush. Okay. So these are all just ways of doing it. Don't worry too much about, you know, whether, you know, you know, the, whether you're using more connective or subordinative or adjectival. However, I do want to do a quick writing exercise. Okay. So let's just take again, four or five minutes, I'll, I'll call you back and to write a kernel sentence, a very short kernel sentence, just a proposition, and then make it into a longer sentence using, if you can, all three of the methods that we just talked, connective, subordinative, and adjectival, okay? And if, don't worry, nobody's gonna test you on this, okay? So just start with this basic sentence and then make it longer using some of these methods. We'll call you back in about four minutes. All right, did anyone um, come up with anything that they wanna read? Remember, it doesn't have to be a great work of art. Yeah, Marianne. Yeah, yeah I'll read one. Um, okay. The, the short sentence, the, the, the kernel, my cats sleep on the sofa, the long one. My cats, sweet tortoiseshell sisters, 
sleep together slumped and warm on the sofa that my mother-in-law gave Steve and me as a wedding present years ago. Beautiful. And, you know, and, and so let me just ask everybody, of, your, of, of those two sentences, which do you prefer, the first or the second? I mean, the second is beautiful, right? And the first one is, is fine, but the second one is actually really gives us so much more information and so much more specificity. And also you managed to get to make a very musical sentence, which is wonderful. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so any, any questions about those? Again, don't get too hung up in the jargon. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be looking at some more jargon right now, but it's basically, I think a lot of this is just sort of tuning in to into the, the rhythm of this kind of thing and allowing yourself to write sentences like this. Because I think that uh, a lot of times, again, we're afraid to because we're sort of, you know, we're, we're kind of trained. Uh, all, it's all about brevity. It's all about economy. Um, keep it short. And, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of wisdom to that. But I think we need to do what, what Edgar Kuhn says, which is let the rosebush go, grow wild sometimes if we want to write really musical sentences. So, um, which is exactly what Marianne just did. So, thank you. So, but I want to talk more about uh, something that's sort of the heart of today, which is cumulative syntax, which is something that I discovered a couple of years ago. I mean, discovered, this is something that we all use. All of these things, you know, when we talk about the craft of writing and particularly the craft of writing sentences, we use this stuff all the time. We just, you know, but by giving it a name, we are, you know, we're allowing ourselves to really, you know, be more conscious about using it and, and to incorporate it as more of a tool in our, in our writerly toolbox. So cumulative syn syntax, I mean, the exercise that we did at the beginning of this class got us thinking about the ways in which, uh, you know, the, how we construct our sentences makes a huge difference in both the feeling and the actual meaning of our prose, right? We talked about how longer sentences can allow you to cover more ground in a certain way, to take you for a trip or to stretch out. Uh, we, maybe we didn't talk about this, but long sentences can allow us to really stretch out a single mo moment, endowing it with a kind of lingering richness. Um, but let's look at another sentence uh, from the, the great naturalist and paleontologist, um, Lauren Isley, to get us started think, you know, to this, uh, thinking about and talking about this idea of um, cumulative syntax. Who will read us the sentence from Lauren Isley's The Firmament of Time? Yeah, Lee, thank you. It is with the coming of man that a vast hole seems to open in nature, a vast black whirlpool spinning faster and faster, consuming flesh, stone, soil, minerals, sucking down the lightning, wrenching power from the, the atom until the ancient sounds of nature are drowned out in the cacophony of something which is no longer nature, something instead which is loose and knocking at the world's heart, something demonic and no longer planned. Escaped, it may be, spewed out of nature, contending in a final giant's game against its master. Lauren Isley, The Firmament of Time. Great, thank you. So, um, by the way, we did have a little uh, M, some M dashes in there. They're not really actually the, the typos. Those should be longer M dashes, but that escaped it may be, which is sort of a parenthetical phrase. Um, David, just for you know, this is one use of M dashes. But, but let's look at the sentence first in terms of economy, because the, the, the fact is, is that sometimes counterintuitively, longer sentences allow you to be more economical as, as we've begun to discuss than short ones do. Um, let's just imagine that this Isley sentence were broken down into its constituent proposition. So man comes, when man comes, a vast hole seems to open in nature. The hole that opens in nature is a vast whirlpool. The whirlpool spins faster and faster. It consumes flesh. It consumes stone. It consumes soil. It consumes minerals, etc. You see what I mean? How that, that you know, this, this, this one long sentence, if you were to break it down into its constituent propositions, would become a much longer paragraph of short sentences, so that the longer sentence is definitely more economical. You see that? Because we're breaking down the parts and we're putting them together. Okay. So, um, so, so if you did it the way that I just did it, if you brought that into short 
uh, sentences, it also kind of ruins the musicality of the sentence, right? Because this sentence, sort of like the one we read from uh, Ray Bradbury, is, has this beautiful sort of flowing rhythm, and Lee read it very well. But also, um, you know, it's it's this way that so it's it, it's let's just say okay so it's, a, it's economical we're not going to talk about why it's musical yet but it's economical right we we're agreeing on this okay so what about specificity because you could also just write this sentence and in fact if you wrote this sentence in a in a uh, in a writing workshop your 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 uh, crit critics might say well why don't you just put it more simply. You know, something like the arrival of the human species altered nature in a noticeable way. There, you're done, right? It's so much more economical, right? You don't you need this long sentence, right? But uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the way that, that the sentence is written gives us much more specificity. It gives us much more color. It's the, the equivalent of, of um, the Tolstoy sentence about moving the Sanibar, Semivar. It really brings us into the sentence in a way, um, you know, and so... Uh, so it's, it's economical and it is more specific than the alternative, the alternative being the arrival of the human species altered nature in a noticeable way. So um, cumulative syntax is about the virtue of addition. The meaning of a sentence should become more precise as you add to it, not less. If it's less, you're not making the sentence better, you're making it worse. But cumulative syntax is also about clarity, about adding meaning, meaning in a structured way that makes a long sentence easier to read, or at least easy to read, not hard to read, uh, which is related to what we just saw, that longer sentences are often more economical in the end as they reduce the need for extra explanatory words. Do we see this? So it's actually, the longer sentence is actually clearer than it would be as short sentences. So cumulative syntax is a great tool for making sentences that are both more specific and more economical because they allow us to pack information in, to add to the concentrated richness or density of our prose. Um, and, you know, here I might just quickly mention, you know, the Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, very important distinction that she makes between leaping and crowding. She's talking about fiction. She's talking about how the important moments need to be crowded with detail. Whereas when you're passing time, you can leap through things. So when you're looking at crowding, this is a, uh, you know, this sentence, the Isley sentence is, is an example of crowding. It gives us lots of richness and um, that you could call it dense density or concentrated richness, which is one of the characteristics of, of you know, good prose. Okay, um, but it can also do that elusive thing that I said we're gonna be coming back to again and again today and, and next time, and that is musicality. And this is what I wanna talk about now. Before we do, do though, is, is, do you guys agree with what I said about density and richness and how, see how longer sentences can, can do that? Okay, so sentence level music, cumulative syntax. How do we go about building it? Because I think we could probably agree that the, both the Bradbury sentence and the Isley sentence that we just read are musical, right? They do have that sense of musicality. So how, and, and so how do you start building this, this musicality of cumulative um, syntax? And I think one way to do it is a good way is to sort of break it down and to look at the structure. So the Isley sentence that we just read is, and, and one of the first distinctions we need to make is right branching versus left branching cumulative syntax. The Isley sentence is classic right branching cumulative sentence. The kernel sentence comes first, and then the subsequent clauses modify that cumulative, that kernel sentence and flow from it, branching off to the right. We see that? Will someone read us this next one, which is also a classic right branching sentence. This is from Tahinezi Coates, We Were Eight Years in Power. Yeah, Marianne, thank you. I was seated in a state office building on 125th Street, not far from the Jamaican patty joint, not far from the fried fish spot, both of which I put to so much injudicious use in those days of conspicuous failure. Ta-Nehisi Coates, we were eight years in power. Okay, so, so the main meaning of the sentence is contained in the kernel clause. I was seated in a state office building. 
And then each of the, the right branching phases that follow add precision to the meaning, making the sentence much more precise and rich and interesting than if he'd just written a short sentence with only the kernel clause, right? It's like the, the sentence that Marianne read. The second sentence that she read was much richer. And same with, the, with this one. If you just, you know, I was sitting in the office building, um, you know, and then he moved on to what he was saying, what he's going to come up with next, which is what he was doing, right? He instead is giving us a lot more richness about the moment that we're in with him. Okay. So that's right branching. Um, generally, right branching is uh, the most form common form of cumulative syntax, in part because it feels natural and intuitive. It's sort of like the way we generally think. It takes the initial meaning and it moves it forward, adding layers of meaning that make the sentence more precise and, and more rich and, and more interesting, right? Um, so now let's look at a sentence that's left branching. And I would also say that, who was it? Was it Lisa? I think Lisa read us a left branching sentence, sent left branching sentence earlier as well. So good job, Lisa, of, of anticipating where we're going. Okay, so um, will someone read us this sentence, the Jane Austen sentence is left branching? With, oh, with yeah. no, I'm oh, sorry. Did someone else raise their hand? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. With no greater events than these in the Longbourn family, and otherwise diversified by little walks, by <laughs> diversified by little beyond walks to Merton, sometimes dirty, sometimes cold, to January and February pass away. Jane okay, Austen. Great. Sorry, I keep interrupting you guys when you're saying the, the names after. That's great, wonderful. So the, do you see how this left branching sentence delays the kernel sentence? So the kernel sentence would be something like January and February did pass away, right? Um, but they're, they're, the left branching is delaying the meaning. So it's doing what we said that the suspensive sentence does. Um, you know, but by delaying the meaning, it is giving us some richness. It's giving us, you know, they took these little walks. Um, there was no greater events. You know, they're, they're, they, it was sometimes dirty, sometimes cold, right? And then we get, you know, January and February passed away. She could have just said January and February did pass away. Now we're in March, the story continues, right? But instead she's giving us, it's, this is actually a way of leaping, well, the, you, to use uh, Ursula Le Guin's term, leaping to pastime, but to do it in a way that's rich. It gives us a sense for how, what, you know, it gives us sort of, it stands in for what the passing time felt like. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, left branching sentences are suspensive because the modifying phrases, places, clauses come first, and then the main subject or meaning of the sentence is delayed to the end. And again, this way we talked about this can add sentence level suspense to your prose. Um, I, the, yeah, go ahead, David. This comment. So I um, just just finished reading this, and and I loved it. I thought I was going to hate it. I just thought it was going to be too. Sorry, pardon if I offend anybody. Too prissy or whatever for me. And. and, and um, my my niece must I think read it about ten times, and uh, uh, but um, I feel that she did something that 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 you said in the past, Tim, that she teaches you how to read her writing because I I think of reading a sentence like this at first kind of slows me down a minute. I, I have to think about what what she's saying because maybe because it's left branching, but um, in the course of reading the book, I you know I just got this a chance to get to know her style. And it just uh, was beautiful toward when I got towards the end. So that's what I felt. That's no, that's, 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 no, that's, that's great. Thank you. I think that's really true. You know, that's one of the reasons that we love Austin is because she's just giving us this, this, the world and the time passing and the real feel for being in this place, in these places and in this culture that's so different. And in this place that's so different than where we live today. Yeah, yeah excellent. Okay, well, can we read, a, let's read a couple more left branching because they're less common. Um, let's look, read, will someone read us this one from John Hay? This is about, he wrote a book called The Bird of Light, which is about terns. If anyone, you know, the bird turn, Arctic terns are a wonderful bird. It's a great little book. Yes, Victoria. From one end of the earth to the other, crossing the seasons, the seabirds roam, following its energies and its food. Great, John thank Hay, you. The bird of light. So what's the kernel sentence here? would you say? Um, the seabirds roam. Yeah, exactly. The seabirds roam. And it's delayed by those initial 
left branching clauses. This is a suspensive sentence, though it also has a right branching phrase at the end, right? And this is important to recognize that most sentences are some, most cumulative syntax is some combination. It's not purely right branching or left branching, but it's possible to have a combination as well. Um, okay, let's read this, this next one. This is from uh, Wallace Stegner's Marking the Sparrow's Fall. Will someone read us this one? Anyone? Marianne, thank you. In the thudding hollows of the skull, deep under the layered blanket, the breath skinned sheepskin, inside the stinging whiskered face and the bony globe that rode jolting on the end of the spine, deep in there, as secret as the organs at the heart of a flower or a nut inside shell and husk, the brain plotted remotely at a heart's pace or a walking pace, saying words that had been found salutary for men or cattle on a brittle and lonesome night, words that not so much expressed as engendered what the mind felt, sullenness, fear, doubt, Wallace Stegner marking the spar sparrow's fall. Thank you. It's a crazy sentence, isn't it? Yeah, that so, was hard to read. Yeah, does anyone want to take a stab at what the kernel sentence of that would be? Something about the brain, the brain yeah. plotted remotely. Yeah, that's that's what I would think. It's sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, or something like the mind felt sullenness, fear, and doubt, you know? Um, mm, okay, yeah. So, so, but it's sort of, it takes us on a journey as we talked about, you know, it really takes us on quite a journey um, and it's and it's also a way of using a long sentence to build uh, suspense. So cumulative syntax can really is really good at creating this impression of moving through time, and this can be quite useful if you're a novelist or a memoirist. You know, as you know, there often times come in when you're writing um, a longer work of narrative where you have to pass time, you have to leap. And so I want to come back to this. Ray Bradbury sentence. I'm just going to read this to you one more time because I want you to think about the way that the time is passing in this sentence. And again, this is about time travel. Out of chars and ashes, out of dust and coals, like golden salamanders, the old years, the green years might leap. Roses sweeten the air, white hair turned Irish black, wrinkles vanish, all, everything, fly back to seed, flee death, rush down to their beginnings, sun rise in western skies and set in glorious easts, moons eat themselves opposite to the custom, all and everything cupping one in another like Chinese boxes, rabbits into hats, all and everything, returning to the fresh death, the seed death, the green death, to the time before the beginning, a touch of a hand might do it, the merest touch of a hand. From the sound of thunder. So I want you to just notice how the first three modifying phrases are left branching and they take us backwards in times, out of chars and ashes, out of dust and coals, like golden salamanders, right? And then we have the kernel sentence, which is something like the old years might leap. And then we have the right branching clauses stepping in, you know, giving us a sensation of accelerating uh, through time, and in this case, back through time. So it's, it's really playing with our this idea of time. This is an example of something we're gonna talk about a lot next time, which is this is a sentence that sings the meaning of itself. It's a sentence about time travel and it takes us using these you know, right branching and left branching you know, techniques of cumulative syntax takes us back through time. Does that make sense? So cumulative syntax is really a great thing uh, for ca you know, capturing the rhythms of time, for example, the rhythm you know, or, or flowing and ebbing movement of downshifting and backtracking of leaping and lingering. And, um, you know, in this case, uh, the, the time travel happens to be going backwards, but often these sentences, these kinds of sentences are used to send us forward through time, you know, because that's what, what we're always trying to do in like a narrative is sort of past time. Um, as we, as you know, we saw in Jane, As Jane Austen, she's basically giving us several months in the course of, of this one left branching sentence that we, we read, okay? So I want to, now I want to get into sort of, you know, a little bit of jargon, but this is really, this is really going to, I think, going to be interesting. And this is the way that cumulative syntax can be broken 
down into three main categories, just like we did before, but this, this is a little bit more complicated. The first one is called coordinate, coordinate cumulative syntax. And again, just a sort of side note here, you don't need to know this stuff. You don't need to memorize this. You use this already, but by looking at it and sort of separating it from its context and examining it, it will make us more confident in its use. Okay, so in coordinative, coordinate cumulative syntax, all the modifying phrases refer to the base clause. So I wanna read each of these sentences twice, once normally, and then the second time looking at the diagram sentence that's on your handout. Will someone give us two versions of the, of, uh, the one from E.B. White? And let's just, say, let's just say, this is from E.B. White, you don't need to say E.B. White once more to the lake at the end of it. Just read this, the sentence once, pause, and then read the sentence, we'll all look at the diagram. Will someone give us this first one from E.B. White? Yeah, Lisa, thank you. Um, we caught two, two bass, hauling them in briskly as if they were mackerel, pulling them over the side of the boat in a business-like manner without any landing net, and stunning them with a blow in the back of the head. We caught two bass, hauling them in briskly as if they were mackerel, pulling them over the side of the boat in a business-like manner, stunning them with a blow on the back of the head. Okay, great. So the diagram kind of allows you to see the most important thing. Not that this is, you know, coordinative cumulative syntax, but the way that the sentence is structured, it is all of those phrases referring back to all, all of those phrases uh, referring back to that initial kernel clause, we caught two bass. That's the basic sentence, but they're all sort of modifying that. It's, and this coordinative cumulative syntax is simple, logical, it's rhythmic, each phrase adds greater specificity and nuance to the original kernel sentence. Do we see this? Okay. So let, will someone read us this next one? This is a subordinate, subordinate cumulative syntax. And this is where you have phrases that modify not only the kernel sentence, but also subsequent phrases. So we're moving from more general to more and more specific. Will someone read us from Sinclair Lewis's Aerosmith? Yeah, Lee. He dipped his hands in the bichloride solution and shook them, a quick shake, fingers down, like the fingers of a pianist above the keys. He dipped his hands in the bichloride solution and shook them, a quick shake, fingers down, like the fingers of a pianist above the keys. Great. Thank you. So you see how the sentence drills down to four different levels of progressive specificity? So each of these clauses modifies the previous one, right? So when he shakes, when he shakes the hands, it's a quick shake, right? And not, a, okay, it's a quick shake, but the fingers are down. And the fingers are like the, so you see how we're, we're drilling down. It's sort of uh, allowing us to kind of zoom in like a movie camera, advancing the sentence and leading us to new, le new and more le specific levels of thought. Do we see that? Okay. Uh, and then the, the final one, the third one, is mixed cumulative syntax. And by far, this is the most common one where you, know, you have both techniques at once. Will someone read us this one from A.S. Byatt's Possession? Yeah, Victoria, thank you. He lit on an image, a woman in a library, a woman not naked, but voluminously clothed, concealed in rustling silk and petticoats, fingers folded over the place where the tight black silk bodice met the springing skirts, a woman whose face was sweet and sad, a stiff bonnet framing loops of thick hair. Hey, I spy it, possession. He lit on an image, a woman in a library, a woman not naked, but voluminously clothed, concealed in rustling silk and petticoats, fingers folded over the place where the tight black silk bodice met the springing skirts, a woman whose face was sweet and sad, a stiff bonnet framing loops of thick hair. Great, thank you. So again, we see in the, the, the diagram, I think helps us see really clearly which of these phrases are referring to which of the preceding ones, right? Um, and, and it's combining the strengths of coordinate and subordinate cumulative syntax. So it's allowing the sentence to drill down to more and more specific meanings, while also sometimes going back to modify and strengthen the original meaning as well. Does that make sense? So again, you never need to know that this is mixed cumulative syntax, but, but by looking at it this way, it will sort of help you use it, right? So 
your 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 ability, I think, will to to construct cumulative uh, syntax will improve if you just recognize it when you see it and listen to it and let it echo in your mind. Um, you know, familiarize yourself with the rhythm. Almost, uh, you know, Virginia Woolf talked about how, you know, when she's writing something new, she can't really get started, and then she just she she starts to feel the rhythm of it and catches the wave. She called it the catching the wave in the mind. She caught, catches the wave in the mind of the rhythm. And that's the same thing you can do with, uh, with you know, cumulative syntax is, you know, listen to it and notice it. And it'll be like, you know, what I mentioned last time about the, the ski turn by sort of stepping back and analyzing, you'll become a much better first draft sentence writer. And then you can also use this in revision because you can be like, well, this seems like a really good place to use some cumulative syntax because you notice how musical sentences are that we've been reading. It's a, it's a really wonderful way to, to create musical sentences. So there's a, let's just read through, I'm gonna read through, no, let, let's, let, I'm gonna let you guys read through these, these next ones. And let's just do the same thing we've been doing um, just to sort of, and, and read them once and then look at the diagram just to, to show you how they're working, just to sort of absorb some of this. Will someone read us this one from Toni Morrison's Jazz? Yeah, David. The clarinets had trouble because the brass was cut so fine, not low down the way they loved to do it, but high and fine, like a young girl singing by the side of a creek, passing time, her ankles cold in the water. The clarinets had trouble because the brass was cut so fine, not low down the way they loved to do it, but high and fine, like a young girl singing by the side of a creek, passing time, her ankles cold in the water. Thank you. Okay, how about this one from the next one from uh, Gatsby, the great Gatsby. Yeah, uh, Marianne, thank you. Perfect. And do you want do you want me to read it just once or um, no, let's do it read twice. it twice? Do it yeah. twice. Okay. Her face was sad and lovely with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was an excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget. A singing compulsion, a whispered listen, a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering in the next hour. Her face was sad and lovely with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was excitement and excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget. A singing compulsion, a whispered listen, a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering in the next hour. Wonderful. Um, Victoria, you want to read us this one from Edward P. Jones? He was the only man in the realm, slave or free, who ate dirt. But while the bondage women, particularly the pregnant ones, ate it for some incomprehensible need, for that something that ash cakes and apples and fat back did not give their bodies, he ate it not only to discover the strengths and weaknesses of the field, but because the eating of it tied him to the only thing in his small world that meant almost as much as his own life. Edward P. Jones, The Known World. He was the only man in the realm, slave or free, who ate dirt. But while the bondage women, particularly the pregnant ones, ate it for some incomprehensible need, for that something that ash cakes and apples and fat back did not give their bodies, he ate it not only to discover the strengths and weaknesses of the field, but because the eating of it tied him to the only thing in his small world that meant almost as much as his own life. Great, thank you. So the, the main point I think is just to sort of, you know, to, to feel and see how these longer sentences can be, can convey their very rich textured and specific information to readers, but also that how well-made cumulative syntax is so good at accomplishing one of the things that is, you know, is a crucial part of what we're talking about in these lessons. And that's musicality and specifically something that we, we, we broached last time pattern and variation. You see how we're, we're working. The diagrams show us how these sentences are based on underlying patterns and that the patterns have variations within them. And that basically essentially is the definition or one of the definitions of music. So this is, you know, so cumulative syntax is a, a really wonderful tool for creating musicality as well as specificity in sentences and economy. 
All right. Um, okay. Ready for one final writing exercise? You can probably guess what it's going to be. Either in your work or just making something up, come up with a kernel sentence and then um, turn it into a much longer sentence by using cumulative syntax. Um, and, you know, if you want to be, you can either pick one, just use coordinate or subordinate, or you can try to do some, a mixed one, okay? Um, and you can also play around with the idea of doing left branching versus right branching, all right? So it's um, 217 right now. So let's come back at, I'll give you enough time. Let's come back at, I hate to be so specific here, but let's say 222. I'll call you back at 222 and now we'll be able to wrap things up, okay? Good luck, 222. See you then. Hey, welcome back. Anybody want to give us a cumulative sentence? Okay. All right. So um, basically, uh, that's all that I have for today. I wanted to uh, just leave some time for any questions or anything like that. And I'll say that next week, we're going to be focusing on really focusing on musicality, talking about um, some sentence level sound effects and, um, and something that I began to talk about today, the, the way that sentences can sing the meaning of themselves. We'll be looking at a lot of sentences that are doing that. And then we'll also be looking at sentences in the context of paragraphs and the way to heighten you know, ways to heighten the musicality of your, you know, so sentences working together to create the musicality of prose in general, okay? So any thoughts or questions or suggestions or doubts or anything? So uh, Tim, the, when you say that the way that the sentence reflects its meaning, is that what you said? Sings, um, the, sings the meaning. Yeah. The, the Lauren Isley quote struck me that way because she's describing the, the process basically of the development of mankind, which was an incredibly mm. complex thing that happened over a very long period. So to write that in short sentences would would not suit the topic. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah, in part, yes. And, and I think you're absolutely right in saying that, you know, that, you know, it is such a big topic and it's such a, it's such a sort of, it has so much gravity as a topic, you know, the, this idea of human evolution, which is happening over millions of years, you know, just putting it in a sort of short, nondescript, you know, unspecific sentence wouldn't really capture it. And, and that, that the way that Lauren Isley is doing that is, is, it is, it's sort of giving it the gravity that's due. We're going to talk about it actually in a, in a much more specific way too, though, next time. And in, in terms of, it, it'll, it, I think it'll be, you'll find it useful. I just yep. wanted to go right back to the beginning and just something I noticed that it's kind of like an evolution of maybe some of us have all experienced going from a first reading experiences like the cat, the cat, um, I know I can't find it, um, cat. was it on page two or the, uh, maybe the very first page? No, I'd say it's page two. Oh, I, actually, maybe it's the first page. The, the cat went to the moon. The, the cat went to the moon. The cat came back. It sounds like Dick and Jane, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it to, to me, as I thought about this through through this, it, it, it those could be two vastly dis, disjointed sentences. They they don't give you any context of of time or uh, you know what. For me, it's like what happens in between. And so often when I'm writing my um, my work emails with uh, my subordinates, I, 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 I feel this urge to make this long run on sentence of, and I'll sometimes run it by my wife and she'll be like, their eyes are gonna roll back in their head. So, so just uh, break it down. But, yeah. but for me, you know, it's, it, it, what this exercise has done for me today is to kind of just um, make it more clear that uh, at least in the, these examples, now, now, you know, novel writing, I suppose, of it's um, it's kind of doing a much better job of telling a story and, and kind of bring bring as you've said the writer in. So I just really appreciate that from, from that perspective. So I don't know so if that makes you. sense. That totally makes sense, and and I will say that you know I am coming at this from the only perspective that I know, which is the novelist's perspective. Um, I can see how a lot of what I'm saying 
for someone who's writing in a business sentence, they might want to do the exact opposite of what we're saying. <laughs> in some cases, you know, that, that you know, that um, I think that, you know, your, your wife's response to your email is probably right. I think, you know, actually brief emails, I'm all about brief emails. It's great. <laughs> but when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, you know, narrative writing like novel and memoir, then I think a lot of the stuff is, 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 can be very useful in terms of endowing that richness in storytelling. So, so can I try um, my example? Um, it's pretty messy. I hope I can read my writing. So um, the leopard she Khan appeared. We, we didn't know what to expect. This was after she had tried to kill Hugo, but was disrupted by the rushing water that burst through the wall of the cave. But in the aftermath, when Hugo saved her drowning cubs, she, she Khan was um, committed to protecting him. Mm. So I don't know, I, I don't think I, I guess what the full exercise was then meant to break that down further into more of an out, outline form or? or uh, well, so this was the last one that we did sort of community. Right. No, I mean, right. I think you, you're doing, you're doing what it, you know, especially, you know, I, I noticed that part where, you know, the water breaks through you know, it's sort of like that. That's an extra phrase that adds a, a kind of some imagistic specificity that really gives us a sense of, you know, more of a, a, a feeling of being inside that story of Shikan, You know, so I, I think it also kind of takes us on so, something of a trip. Right. Okay. But so, so, it, so the, the cumulative syntax is really good for stretching out, for passing time, for showing the passage of time, also for stretching out a given moment and really sort of putting us inside that moment, you know? Okay, thanks. You noticed earlier, I think, that um, in John Le Carre, that uh, the, in his scenes of action, the sentences tend to be shorter, whereas in his scenes of description, the, the, the sentences tend, tend to be longer. And I think that's a, an observation that holds here. Um, one of the great things about, and underestimated things about descriptive writing in narrative prose, and particularly in fiction, is that it is it is it is the, the tool by which we become immersed in the story because it's giving us that sort of imagistic specificity that you know activates our imagination. And oftentimes, long sentences can can be helpful in terms of getting that across. Right, and, and in honor of the death of now I'm forgetting her name, just died. Hillary uh, Mantel. Okay. Right. So I start, we started listening to uh, Wolf Hall on the way down and she's got some great, uh, wonderful sentences, right? And, and really, so it's, you really have to, I found I really have to focus on those. So she is a, she's a master and just like John Le Carre, one of the great masters of contemporary literature. Very, very sad loss indeed. Mm. Too so, young. The wonderful thing is we have her work and it will endure, so. Mm. Um, any other, any final questions before we wrap things up? Well, it's great to see all of you and uh, good luck, good writing karma your way. And, you know, next, next week again, we'll be, we'll be really, I think, trying to put everything that we've been talking about together and, and uh, working on ways to become more musical. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.